uh, in English. Since the Hello, beginning white of the villages pandemic, near mine got genocided in Syria by Sunni freedom fighters. Center, yeah, Alevis are, uh, uh, Alevis are a religious uh, minority in Turkey and in that region that are uh, persecuted unjustly, like, all the fucking time. Pretty fucked up. Why Turks don't Syrians? I love whites in English, I guess. Uh -huh. Warning. COVID-19 has devastated the Rio Grande Valley, which is about 90% Latino. Okay. This region has some of the highest per capita death rates in Texas, a state that also happens to have the highest uninsured rate in the country. That's why this center has become a community hub to get tested and receive urgent treatment for those that can't afford to see a provider. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing, Ms. Lugus? Mariana Luyando is a physician assistant originally from El Salvador. Getting ready for the day, making sure that we have our PPE. 25 years ago, she got into medicine to help communities underserved by the healthcare system. Joseph? Hi, how are you? So tell me what's going on right now. Um, recently I was exposed to COVID. I was working with my grandfather. He was feeling sick in the morning. He left in the afternoon to uh, go get tested and he tested positive. Okay, are you having any symptoms right now? Um, just a headache yesterday. I felt a little bit of a fever. Okay. And um, before that, I felt like a pretty constant sore throat for about a week. Joseph Gomez's grandfather, a construction manager, tested positive for COVID-19 after Joseph was working on a construction site with him. His grandfather later passed away after spending multiple weeks in the ICU. Fuck, right, I'm just gonna take a quick pick on your throat. Don't breathe out, okay? So we're gonna do this real quick. Okay, good. You know, you have been exposed, you know, so we'll find out. We, it's a possibility that we'll find out today if you're positive or not. And if you're negative, then we'll proceed with another test. So until we get that other test, I still need a self-quarantine, right? Until then, yes. All right, so we're gonna do two in the nose, all the way back on both sides, okay? Mm -hmm. For the patients that are testing positive, what does that reality mean for them? It's difficult. It's very difficult. Some of our patients, you know, maybe deferred the treatment or sick treatment because they were afraid that, you know, once they're tested, was official per se, you know, that they had to actually report it to their employers. Therefore, they were um, obligated to stop working, you know. Um, others were afraid of a positive, you know, or confirmed diagnosis and faced with the possibility of losing their jobs. Who's processing our foods right now, you know? And if our migrant workers or farm workers do not have the protection that we all have, I mean, I think that it, that's gonna be detrimental. Texas has the most COVID-19 cases of any state in the U.S. And 17% of the state's deaths have happened right here in the Valley, even though it only represents 4.7% of Texas's total population. The reality is, Brownsville and the rest of the Valley are particularly vulnerable to this virus. Not only do many people lack access to healthcare, but many also live in multi-generational households that make it hard to contain the spread. They're the ones who work as bus boys. They're the ones who pick the fucking um, fruits and vegetables. They're the ones who work in processing centers for poultry and meat. So, they are the permanent underclass. And because they are the permanent underclass in America, that's why the wealthy Americans in Texas can be like, no, we've got to keep our small businesses open. Because the ones who are dying, the ones who are suffering the most casualties are the Hispanic people of Texas. The ones that live in El Paso, the ones that live in this area. One of the things that we actually want to make sure that, you know, this condition has not, you know, um, had an effect on your lungs. Okay, take a deep breath in and out. In July, 
31-year-old Talia Hernandez didn't feel well, but she waited to go to the hospital until she couldn't breathe, which is what the news had told her to do. She spent almost an entire month in the hospital with COVID-19 and came close to being intubated. I'm constrained by the oxygen machine, right? Like I can only go as far as the cord will let me. When you look around you, why are so many young Latinos being impacted by this virus in the valley? A lot of the workforce here, like in the valley, are the younger people, and those are the people still working and getting sick. I think the fact that our culture, right, we're very family oriented. Um, most of us have really big families and you're only supposed to see immediate family, but it's like, yes, th that, that immediate family is really big. Sometimes they live in single, single households as well, especially if you're not wealthy. You're taking care of your parents, you're taking care of your grandparents. You have to go outside, you don't have the freedom. You get sick, take it back home, everybody else is sick, they die. This week, we're seeing a lot more numbers. The point is, what we must be doing right now is stopping. Especially in like El Paso and shit. Lockdown. <clears throat> Lockdown. And start giving these people direct cash. To save them. But because it's predominantly brown people dying, it doesn't fucking matter. That's the reality. Okay? That's the reality. It's predominantly brown people dying, so it doesn't matter. The white business owners want to keep the businesses open. White people living in the suburbs want to keep going to Chili's and Applebee's and shit. Of positivity. Why do you think that is? You know, we have transitioned and we are... Um, opening up a little bit more in the community, more uh, services, more restaurants, you know, have actually increased their capacity. Now I think they're open 75%. If we let our guard down, I think that we're going to go back to the same situation that we had back in May. Many cases that we have here. Plan manager Tom Hart organized a cash buy and winner take all betting pool for supervisors and managers to wager how many plan employees would test positive for COVID 19. More than a thousand, more than a thousand workers at the plant contracted COVID. Here, a patient have actually lost more than two family members wow. in, in less than a month. The health center hasn't just witnessed the community's losses. They've had some of their own. In July, an employee at the center named Maricruz Rangel was killed by the virus. She was 28 years old and three months pregnant. Oh my God. <laughs> she was that on my birthday. She's a fun person, so that's that's her. I think that was uh, during lunch. What was your reaction when you found out she had COVID? I mean, like here, I had COVID. I got he COVID. He had COVID. I the think term. it was a shock that you know that it affected her so badly. We attended her daughter's birthday parties. You know, it's just so surreal uh, you know to think that she's really gone what does mighty Cruz's family need the most right now what's the biggest challenge they're up against i think it's financial yes because mighty cruz was the breadwinner for the most part danny and josie are social workers at the health center they typically make home visits to check in on their patients and assist them with things like groceries they've added rangel's family to their route ever since their friend passed away Rangel's parents are now taking care of her six-year-old daughter, Victoria. The three of them also tested positive for the coronavirus earlier this year. Rangel? <laughs> Bien, 
y batallando pues por que como yo me encuentro y con el compromiso de la niña. Sí, claro. Bueno, antes de que llegara la pandemia, eh, me dedicaba de lavar platos en un restaurantito. This is literally the picture I drew for you many times over. Whenever you say like, oh, in these southern states, like, oh, people are dying from COVID. Like, it's just, a, you know, a Darwin Award. It's like, no, it's not. Young white dude who doesn't believe in COVID might catch it. Or even an older white dude who doesn't believe in COVID might catch it. But they're spreading it to poor people who have no fucking, not even a white dude, doesn't matter. Like a rich person catches COVID. Might not even hit them as hard. But they spread it to this community. It's not an accident that they, that so many people, that so many people in this community are uh, afflicted. They're, they're, they're impacted, they're devastated by it because they live in the same houses. A lot of the people that are in these communities are working. They have to work in the front lines. They have to fucking work nonstop. Yeah, we said fuck those rich people in denial. You said don't say that? Wait, what? En marzo que empezó la pandemia, cerraron el negocio. Y... You literally told the chatter, I don't care if your family dies from Corona, stop pretending to be a good person. You should have been permabanned from Twitch for that. Wait. Are you fucking literally equating the people that straight the fuck up were denying COVID and giving it to people like this family? And I said, I don't care if they fucking die in that circumstance, if they are the ones who are knowingly and willingly spreading it because they themselves are going to be fine. Like if they catch COVID, then that's not, a hi, I'm new here. Is it true that you don't pay your editors? I hate people say that because I'm so sincere and believable. And you say, just curious. Then why do you say don't editors is true? Is it true that people, oh, oh, Jesus Christ, dude. Oh, you guys clapped him already. I was talking about in fucking triage. That low life loser you just banned is just making new accounts. Don't give him attention. Yo, RTBA, I bet you know who the fuck this is. Why don't you clap him from fucking DGG too? Hit him where it actually hurts. It's very clear that he like doesn't give a shit about being here, but it's very clear what community he's coming from. Why don't you clap his ass for a little bit, you know? Give him a little spanking so that, uh, you know, hit him where it actually fucking hurts. Stupid fucking loser, dude. Jesus Christ. How would the mods know? Well, RTBA also uh, mods the other uh, community where uh, some of those just curious Andes come from. <sighs> anyway. Let's, uh, let's, uh, top of the hour, every hour, six second hour break. Ne? I don't know. Hold on, mom. I'm in the middle of something. Uh, top of the hour, every hour, six second hour break. Um, and then we're going to continue the video and finish it. Okay. No digo yo que nada más nosotros estamos pasando por esta situación. Hay mucha gente que perdió un tío, un abuelito, un hermano, un papá, una mamá. ¿verdad? No nomás nosotros. Pero yo en lo personal nunca pensé que nos fuera a pasar una situación de esta. Porque en realidad pues nadie lo esperamos. Habiendo vivido lo que han vivido. That motherfucker was talking about me saying oh, uh, people deserve to die in triage. Really, really, that dude was that dude was was upset that I was saying that like you should fucking sign a waiver if you knowing and fucking willingly are spreading COVID to people that are are not getting are literally not getting fucking uh 
uh, the the treatment because they gave COVID to them. I, I still believe it. I really think like if you're running around, you should fucking sign a waiver. Okay, if you want to be maskless, then you don't get to you don't get to be a part of triage. Okay, during triage, you don't get to have uh you you don't get to be in the front. There you go. I did run an ad. Yeah, I did. Man, these people are so fucking disgusting, dude. Your daddy literally said, mow down people in a fucking car. Like, mow down leftist protesters. And you're out here talking to me about my shit. Acting like what I've said is fucking indefensible. You piece of shit motherfucker. This is why... God damn, dude. Like, god fucking damn it, dude. Holy shit, this shit triggers the fuck out of me so much. Just... Para nosotros es ver la niña crecer. Dale. No, tú te la puedes, tú te la puedes, dale, dale. COVID's impact has meant so much more than death in the valley. The lasting effects of the pandemic have hurt multi-generational Latina families all across the U.S with the latest death toll hitting over 45,000 Latinos. And things aren't looking like they're getting any better. Lower socioeconomic status is linked to poor health. And I think that the community health center has been able to address those issues in the past, you know, but again, it's just one center for, you know, how many people. Community health centers like this one, do they have the resources that they need to succeed? I don't think so. I mean, and, and I think that that's what, you know, um, I think is so unique, you know, that um, an individual could come to a community health center like ours, and it, it may actually be the one stop. I think that we should empower the community health centers and to, you know, to make sure that we that we become a, a way of, of meeting those health disparities. Amanda, you, you work at the center, mm -hmm. and you're one of the rare cases of staffers getting COVID-19. Yes. When did you find out you had COVID? Uh, I had COVID, well, I actually found out in my work. I started to... I get the sentiment of someone who works in public health, it's like even if someone is ODing on Fent. No, I think that's entirely different. <laughs> no, I, 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 I've talked to this before as well. Of course, you gotta fucking treat everybody. Of course, you got to fucking treat everybody equally. I understand that. But one is addiction. One is a disease. You're a doctor and you have to treat someone with an addiction, even if they're coming back over and over again. That's entirely different than someone like purposely fucking going around. The, the other argument is like in a triage circumstance, if you have a healthy murderer in a mass shooting, okay, a healthier murderer who you can actually... Uh, a save or uh, I guess not even save but yeah yeah exactly in one circumstance you have a healthier murderer who's also in pain and also needs to be recovered versus the victims okay the victims can also be saved but it's less likely that you can save them you're probably going to go and, and focus on the victims right you're not going to let the victims die because the murderer fucking shot them that's how I'm treating it. That's basically what I'm trying to say. A person knowingly avoiding COVID-19 restrictions and claiming the virus is fake slash not mask wearing is actively being malicious. Yeah, and spreading it to other people. That is not triage at all. You treat the one that's more likely to be safe first, not the one that you would rather survive the most. Oh my God. Oh my God. This person is not understanding what I'm saying. I understand how triage works. I'm saying that in this circumstance, in my fucking worldview, if someone is, if someone has the gun 
even if they are more likely to be saved, I would treat the person that's a ha a harder to save first. That's what I'm saying. I understand how triage works. I would, save, I would try to save the victim over the murderer. But that's not how triage works. I know that's not how triage works, guys. I, I know. I know. I understand. I'm saying that non-mask wearing Andes who don't agree to wearing masks and think it's fake should sign a do not resuscitate. That's, that's what they should be doing. They should be signing a DNR, basically. I know how fucking triage works. I'm saying that this is how it should work, okay? And I don't even know if I fucking fully believe in it. I'm just fucking mad. I mean, I just get angry, unreasonably angry. And that's why I say uh, this sort of thing. But it's not a immoral position to have. Okay? You can try to jerk off with like your philosophy trolley problem style memes over and over again. But it does not matter. Uh, I, it, this is not like a take that you can say, well, like Hassan wants to murder people. You can't say that. I'm saying that in this circumstance, if you're knowingly putting other people in harm's way, and as a consequence of your fucking actions, other people are very likely uh, uh, getting this disease, then they should get first treatment over you. Okay? And it does feel good emotionally. And that's why I'm saying it. And it's draconian, and it's against uh, my worldview as far as, like, rehabilitation over capital punishments. Don't you think that this is not you? Don't you think that this is not utilitarian? No, it's it's not because if your goal is to uh, save as many people as possible, you would always go for the fucking healthy person, or not not the healthy person. They're incorrect about triage. You were right. Do you place the person with the least issues to a lower priority? Wait, I thought if you're literally if one person is gonna die, they just don't go after. They don't save that person. And no, I'm not assuming innocence or guilt in that circumstance. People are signing off. It's a DNR. Guys, I don't want doctors to figure out who's guilty and who's not. I just want someone to sign a do not resuscitate form, basically. Do you understand? I want someone to sign a do not resuscitate, like an identical thing to a DNR. In this circumstance, if you're running around without a mask, and you don't want to fucking wear a mask, and you're knowingly and willingly giving people COVID, you're basically, you should sign a do not resuscitate. It's the same exact fucking principle. Feeling like a lot of pressure on my chest. I did something that I've never really felt before. Like I know my body, I know how I am. So I thought maybe, oh, it's because I had it in the mail, so I went about it and take anything. And then um, I just felt, well, you know what? I think I want to get checked because uh, I didn't feel myself. So right about it. Like, do you know when you when you got the virus? I don't know if I got it there or I got it from like a relative of mine. I'm not sure because yeah. um, I know my brother did come positive too. Um, but uh, Do you live with your brother? Uh, yes, I live with my brother. Are there many folks in your house? Uh, yes, uh, my brother, my husband, my parents. So there, there's, there's a lot of people, which yeah. which seems to be a reality in the valley, right? Multi generational households, yes. many families in one house. Does that make containing the virus harder? Uh, yeah, honestly, it does. Um, Why? Well, one because I mean, you, you, once you get it, you don't. You want to make sure that nobody else has it. Yeah. Uh, especially because my my mom is uh, she's an older she's older. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want anything to happen to her. And then, of course, my son, um, he's only one. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him either. I mean, it's just the factor of making sure that nobody has it. In other multi-general households, how easy is it to contain the virus? It, it's very difficult. We have had some, actually, patients, you know, um, that reported to us that um, I had to actually, they locked me in a room, you know, pretty much, you know, because, and everybody else had to, you know, pretty much stay in other areas of the, the home or even the apartment.
you know, um, we're assuming that it is a home if it is, you know, um, you know, different families living together. But what about people that can't afford to isolate? I mean, what about people that are essential workers like yourselves? Families, not patients, families not reporting that everyone in the family, you know, uh, had actually, you know, uh, tested positive after, you know, uh, being exposed to a family member, you know, or uh, one of the family members is um, positive for COVID and yet he's the only person who's actually uh, working at the time. So it, it, it has been extremely difficult for, uh, you know, some families. Is that a unique factor of the Rio Grande Valley? Like is, is the, is the multi-generational component something that makes COVID-19 such a threat in this area? I, I think so. I would say Absolutely. so. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the people here, you, you hear it a lot here in the, especially here in the Valley, Lower Valley. Um, they take care of their parents. A lot of people- You get fucking wiped, dude. One person, a nurse in the family gets COVID and the whole family gets COVID. They all live together. They don't have the opportunity to fucking socially distance in their, in their like, you know, two unit uh, apartments or whatever the fuck they live in. People take care of their parents. So that was a big worry, you know, uh, am I going to take it home to my older parents? Uh, a lot of family members even work as providers for their older, you know, their older parents or their tias, their tias, you know, uncles, nephews. 